This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Israel's Prime Minister makes a last minute trip to London to visit Britain's Prime Minister and the U.S. Secretary of Defense. The reason? The growing danger of Iran. Plus, Israelis get ready to go to elections for the second time within months. And United Hatzalah, Israel's innovative answer to emergency care. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made a last-minute trip to London to meet with England's Prime Minister Boris Johnson and U.S. Secretary of Defense Mark Esper to discuss the growing danger of Iran. Before he left for London, Netanyahu told reporters why the trip was so important. This morning, we learned of another violation, more defiance by Iran, this time in the field of its goal of nuclear arms. This is in addition to Iran's aggressive actions against international shipping, against regional countries, and also its attempts to carry out murderous attacks against Israel, attempts that have not stopped. The IDF released satellite photos of an Iranian-built base inside Lebanon's Bekaa Valley. The Hezbollah facility in Lebanon uses Iranian-supplied machinery to convert simple missiles into guided missiles with an accuracy of less than 10 meters. And while it's quiet on Israel's northern border for now, Israel and Iran's proxy Hezbollah nearly went to war along the Lebanese-Israeli border. Hezbollah fired several anti-tank missiles at IDF positions inside Israel and nearly destroyed this IDF ambulance driving near the border. The IDF responded with artillery, blasting Hezbollah positions inside Lebanon. Netanyahu said Israel fired 100 shells from the land and air. He said there were no Israeli casualties, no injuries, not even a scratch. The escalation began when Iran tried to send a killer drone into the Golan Heights. Israel stopped that attack and then struck a key component of Hezbollah's effort inside Lebanon to manufacture precision-guided missiles in order to strike Israel. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah vowed retaliation, and his deputies said they planned a calculated strike, but did not want to spark another war with Israel. The danger of Hezbollah and Iran is one of the main concerns for Israeli voters as they go to the polls this month. For the first time ever, Israelis will go back to the polls to vote in national elections for a second time in one year. Here's more on what caused this and what's at stake, followed by analysis with our Middle East correspondent, Julie Stahl, in our studio. Israeli voters are expressing different priorities as they plan for the September national elections. Security matters more than anything else. Things, issues like Iran, like Hamas. The most important issue for me is uh, to stay uh, a Jewish state, a strong state. According to political scientist Dr. Emmanuel Navon, however, there's only one real issue. Netanyahu, that is the topic of the election, uh, basically. That is what uh, blue and white is all about, being against Netanyahu. Likud is about supporting Netanyahu. And that's also why we are having an early election. Israelis will have more than 30 political parties or lists to choose from on September 17th. The parties will be competing for 120 Knesset seats. The party winning the most seats will likely be asked to form the next government. And that's where it gets complicated. According to opinion polls, Netanyahu's Likud party is running even with the liberal blue and white party led by Benny Gantz. That means all eyes are on Avigdor Lieberman of the Israel Bitenu party as the potential kingmaker. Neither Likud nor blue and white have a coalition. Uh, In other words, it's very clear from most polls that Netanyahu will not have a right-wing coalition without Lieberman and Benny Gantz will not have a central-left coalition without Lieberman either. Lieberman wants a unity government made up of elements from both Likud and blue and white. In other words, we're not going to go to elections again. Forget about this. There's no such scenario. Over the summer, Netanyahu became Israel's longest-serving prime minister. Supporters credit him for the strong economy improving relations with neighboring Arab states, and helping make ties with the U.S. stronger than ever. His detractors point to his legal problems, an upcoming indictment on corruption charges. Israelis are divided. Our government is very corrupted. I myself uh, very hate um, 
Benjamin Netanyahu. If all your life you went to a dentist or a, a car person that fixed your car and he did doing a good job for years, why will you replace him, right? The same baby is doing a good job for years. So come the elections, the world will see whether or not Israelis still believe Netanyahu is the only viable choice as leader for Israel. Julie, for those people outside Israel, you know, politics here can be kind of complicated. How would you simplify it for them? As we mentioned in the in the story, there are more than 30 parties are going to be voting for. Now, people are going to vote based on their own considerations, the platform of the parties, the members of the parties, what they what they want to vote for. In the end, whichever party gets the most votes, um, probably that one, President right. Reuven Rivlin will ask that party to form a government if he can. Now that might sound simple, like because wouldn't everybody want to be in the government? But then the parties start to make their own demands. They, uh, they want the defense ministry, the foreign ministry, education ministry, and then, it, then, we, then we begin to see who's lining up with who and w what parties are going to have how much power. Yeah, and that's the problem they had the last time. Uh, is this election, is it actually a referendum on Netanyahu? Many people are saying that. Uh, we talked to a lot of people on the streets of Jerusalem, and you might have thought we were doing like a pro Netanyahu ad or something because they were all like for Netanyahu. If we went to Tel Aviv or somewhere else, it, we would probably get a different kind of result. What was interesting to me is it didn't matter who it was. It could, there were young people, old people, religious, secular, all sorts of people that were saying, yes, Netanyahu. Even people who didn't like him and didn't believe in what he said they were also very supportive of Netanyahu. Well, we'll see what's going to happen in just a few days. Thanks, Julie. Up next, after ISIS, where is the region heading after the most brutal Islamist group in recent history left its mark on the Middle East? Roman soldiers destroy the Second Temple of Jerusalem. Centuries of eyewitnesses say the temple treasures survived. But where are they? They went from Jerusalem to Rome, Rome to Carthage, Carthage to Byzantium. Historians are silent about what happened to it next. CBN Documentaries presents the worldwide release of Treasures of the Second Temple. So does it still exist today? A story of mystery. Where is it? Calamity. Most of the victims were butchered. And destiny. The possibility to dig is impossible. Get your copy of Treasures of the Second Temple. Yours for a gift of any amount to CBN Documentaries. for a moment what it was like to be a child. You believed every story you were told. You saw a world full of endless possibilities. What stories will the world's orphaned and at-risk children believe? We believe the Bible tells the only story truly worth believing. We believe that every child should have the opportunity to dream the chance to take challenges and turn them into possibilities, the chance to stand on the promises of God, to recognize their place in the greatest story ever told. They have their whole lives ahead of them. Theirs is a world of endless possibilities. They are looking for a story to believe. We will tell them that story. Will you join us?
For several years, ISIS spread its reign of terror throughout the Middle East. We talked with one reporter who spent years documenting how this Islamic group affected the region and the people of the Middle East. All right, Seth, you wrote a book called After ISIS, America, Iran, and the Struggle for the, for the Middle East. Why did you write the book? Well, I was going back and forth to places like Iraq or Jordan or Turkey for several years, from 2014 to 2018. And I was seeing things there that I felt were not being sufficiently documented. For instance, I remember going to Sinjar right after they'd found all these mass graves of victims of ISIS. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we saw matted human hair and human remains. And this was clearly like uh, the aftermath of a genocide. And I felt it was things that I'd seen when I was a child reading about the Second World War. And I felt this is a story that has to be told, not just in a series of articles. This has to all be put in one place so we can understand the real horrors that this whole region faced in the last few years, including the destruction of Christian communities, the selling of Yazidi girls and women into slavery, and also see that, you know, this region, the Middle East, Iraq, it's not just a place of conflict. This is real human stories. This matters to the whole world. And groups like ISIS, you know, they don't just stay in places like Iraq. They eventually threaten people in London or New York or Japan or wherever. What do you think the lessons that need to be learned from your book? Well, hopefully not only to humanize the victims and the refugees, but also to get a sense of the fact that what's happened in the last few years in the Middle East puts the whole region at a, at a kind of 100-year crossroads, 100 years since the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And we're now, what happens now will determine what happens in the next 100 years. What about, for instance, the rise of Iran? What about Turkey, Russia as new allies? You know, what happens to America's role in the region? What happens to Israel? What happens to key allies and friends in the region? Mm -hmm. And in order to understand that, we, I think, need to not only read about it, but then think about, okay, what we do now is going to affect things in 20 or 50 years. Do you see that after ISIS or during the fall of ISIS, Iran was one of the players that really emerged in the Middle East? Yes, Iran has benefited from the defeat of ISIS. Iran helped to play a role, of course, to help defeat them, which is a good thing. But Iran used that role to leverage its kind of influence in Iraq and Syria and to then entrench so that Iran, once it was sent its militias into Iraq, it didn't leave Iraq. All of its militias stayed behind in all these places. And it is using those militias, I think, to threaten not only the US and Israel, but other countries. Iran's militias are not building universities. They're stockpiling weapons and missiles. You talked about humanizing the conflict. Tell us about what happened to the Christians, Yazidis, and other minorities uh, in this region. Well, I remember one time in a city called Karakosh, which used to be home to 50,000 Christians, very close to Mosul. We drove through there right after it had been liberated. It was a totally deserted city. Some of it was still intact, but when you went into the churches, they had torn down the crosses and they'd beheaded the statues and pictures of, of Jesus and the Virgin Mary. And we met with some of the locals, you know, and it was unclear whether or not they felt they had a future in that area. We went into one church where ISIS had transformed part of it into a bomb-making factory. And what's great to see is, you know, a year after that, those churches are back functioning and those people are celebrating Easter. And it's the same thing, I think, with the Yazidis. I mean, here's a minority group, an ancient minority group, which horrible things were done to them. And they still live in refugee camps, and it's important to see the question is, okay, can they come back to their lands? Will there be security for these people? Do you see this was a watershed moment for many of the Christians in the region? Well, unfortunately, I think it was because many Christians in places like Iraq had been suffering under terrorism for years. But the, all of a sudden, the rise of ISIS, and I think the fact that the international community didn't respond quick enough, meant that you know tens of thousands of people had to flee their homes. And these, in some cases, were the last Christians in places like Mosul. And for many of them, this was the kind of last straw. And I know that when many of those I met who were living in the Kurdish region in Erbil said, listen, I'm not going to go back. I'm going to Europe. I can't, I can't do this anymore. These are people that have been there for 1,000, 1,500, 1,600 years, right? And I think it's an important question as to whether or not, you know, organizations or countries will step forward to rebuild those churches and make sure that people feel secure. You talk in the book about going forward and offering a few scenarios about what might happen. What do you see going forward? Well, I think one scenario is that even though there's just been a very difficult and bloody war, there could now be another war between Iran and America and all the allies of the two, right? That's one scenario. Another scenario is that the region is tired of war and that even though we have an emerging Iranian threat or hegemony, even though Turkey is drifting towards Russia, that people begin to reinvest in rebuilding cities in Syria and Iraq and that maybe the region decides that you know, religious extremism and terrorism is something of the past 
and we're not going to go down that road again. And for the people that are going to read the book, what do you want them to take away from this? I want them to see a story that I think is partly about good and evil in the sense that ISIS, you know, wasn't just another jihadist organization. It's not just another Al Qaeda. What ISIS did was uniquely evil in terms of selling people into slavery, committing mass genocide. It went far beyond what groups like the Taliban have done. And I think the people that fought ISIS, like the Kurds in northern Iraq, or the people in, in Syria, the Kurdish units there, I mean, I think these people did what was right at the right time, and also the American forces that went, the volunteers that went to help. I think it's important to recognize the, the bravery that these people did and not just forget about them afterwards and say, okay, the war's over and everyone can go home. Coming up, see how Israel is revolutionizing emergency care and saving lives. Come on, Give me that. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Ah, sure, life is busy, but I found a way to make a huge difference in people's lives. I guess you could say I'm changing the world right here from home. I bring medical supplies and doctors to people in need and dig wells so that villagers can have clean and safe water to drink. I make it possible to preach the gospel in over a hundred countries, including right here in America. And when disaster strikes, I'm there, providing food, thank you, and emergency supplies to give people hope again. Every day, CBN and I are making the world a better place. Here you go. My life is hectic, so I joined CBN through Pledge Express. My bank does all the work, and I know that my gift is being used where it's needed most. So become a CBN partner and join Pledge Express, because you can do a world of good right from where you are. Hey, good morning. Are you ready to get started? Hey, if you're tired and exhausted all day, you can't think clearly, and you really just need a cup or even a pot of coffee to get through your day, then join me, Dr. Josh Axe, for this new series where I'm going to teach you how to transform your diet and use essential oils and supplements to get a better night's sleep. Get protect your sleep and live your best life with innovative information from five leading sleep experts. If you're not a great sleeper, you can do things to make yourself a great sleeper. If you're already a pretty good sleeper, you can enhance your sleep and be even better. Discover a sleep enhancing bedtime routine. How to put insomnia to rest. Learn how to relieve pain that disturbs sleep. And much more in Protect Your Sleep. Everything you do, you do better with a good night's sleep. Wake up to your best life. Call 1-800-700-7000 to get your free DVD or booklet of Protect Your Sleep today. Don't miss out on this brand new series. According to one survey, the average time for an ambulance to reach an accident or medical emergency in the U.S. is 15 minutes. Imagine if you could reduce that to three minutes or even less. One Israeli organization has imagined that, and they believe it can change the world. This is what it's like to ride through the streets of Israel on an ambulance cycle. It weaves through traffic where an ambulance cannot. CBN News got a first-hand look. We're riding around with uh, United Hatzalel volunteers here on the streets of Jerusalem, where they can respond to a medical emergency or an accident within 90 seconds. It's really the game changer in life-saving emergency medical care. We think that the largest cause of preventable death in the West is waiting for an ambulance. And United Hatzalah addresses that by getting a volunteer, someone who's trained, equipped, notified, and in the immediate vicinity of the victim to that person within 90 seconds or in a larger geography, three minutes. United Hatzalah, which means rescue, is the inspiration of Eli Beer. People die every day waiting for help. My dream for United Salah is make sure that no one will ever die from things that they could be saved. Growing up, I decided I want to become a doctor and save lives. Beer shared that dream on a Ted Med talk that went viral. He said as a young ambulance driver, he often arrived at an emergency too late to save a life and decided to change that. Together with 15 of my friends, we were all EMTs. We decided let's protect our neighborhood. So when something like that happens again, we will be there running to the scene a lot before the ambulance. From 15 friends years ago, today United Hatzalah has 5,000 volunteers throughout Israel. Their ability to respond to an emergency in three minutes or less rests on three things. The ambu cycle, volunteers available at a moment's notice, and technology connecting them. You know, Israelis are good in technology. Every one of us has 
on his phone, no matter what kind of phone, a GPS technology done by Nowforce. And whenever a call comes in, the closest five volunteers get the call. And they actually get there really quick and navigate it by a traffic navigator to get there and not waste time. And this is a great technology we use all over the country and reduce the response time. There's another emergency that just uh, went off right now. We're currently in United Hatzalah's National Command and Dispatch Center. And what's happening right behind me here is that volunteers from around the country in the eight different regions that we broke the country down into are being dispatched to emergencies. We receive about a thousand emergencies per day. Then volunteers from each cross-section of Israeli society go into action. That's where the AmbuCycle comes in. Everything that's in an ambulance is in this AmbuCycle. Yeah. So this is like a life-saving measures within the first couple of minutes of a right. crisis. Right. So I get to the call within three minutes or less. I arrive, I throw on my jacket, and I immediately start treating. Everything that the ambulance has, except the stretcher, is in this box right here. I have a defibrillator under the seat, and everything else is in this bag. This life-saving equipment can often get to an emergency sooner than an ambulance. This real-life video shows an ambulance stuck in traffic and an ambucycle weaving its way through. But they exist to complement rather than compete with the ambulance. Basically, we're there to fill the gap. So until the ambulance arrives, in those first, first crucial critical minutes, we have help is on scene. Help has arrived, we are stabilizing, and by the time the ambulance comes, he is ready for transport to the hospital. And getting there in 90 seconds is the game changer in EMS worldwide. That time gap can mean life or death. I can tell you every second counts, and if you wait two more seconds for someone who has no oxygen for more than six or seven minutes, there is no chance of saving that person. And if you do save him, that person will have damage for the rest of their life and will need assistance. So by having thousands of volunteers, think about it, it's like Uber, everywhere. Gabby Friedson has responded to more than 9,000 emergency calls. Now he's in the U.S. to spread the news about this revolution in emergency response. I meet with police chiefs or fire chiefs, other medical professionals, even mayors of the city, to really try to understand what it is that we do, what we've accomplished, um, and that they can get it done too. Friedson believes an untapped U.S. labor force is just waiting for the opportunity to save lives. I tell them we have so many veterans who are medics who are probably at home or even retired doctors and physicians that, you know, it's possible that they're trained, they want to help, they just need that, you know, someone that can really lift them off uh, and get that ball rolling. The revolutionary model is now rolling in Jersey City and five other countries. The dream is to take it worldwide. Nothing like this exists anywhere else in the world. It's an Israeli innovation and an Israeli invention that it's our dream is to bring it to everybody else so that victims of heart attacks and strokes and choking and bleeding have the same chance of life in Jersey City, in Omaha, Nebraska, in Panama, in Mexico, as they do in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Beer sees it as another way Israel wants to help beyond its borders. This is a tikkun olam. This is a gift to the world. We are light over the nations in terms of many things, technology, no one realized that in medicine, fast response, Israel's the fastest in the world, and we could share this with everyone. Up next, hear more from Israelis about their upcoming elections and what's at stake for the Jewish state. We will move the American embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. As the nations rage, you can stand with Israel. History is being written, and I want to be a part of it. Call 1-800-700-7000 and get to life. This is our nature as a country. Discover the untold story of how Israeli volunteers are changing the world. We consider it our duty to reach out and help others around the world. For a gift of $10 or more, you can own the acclaimed CBN documentary, To Life. To treat a human, no matter what he is, which religious he has, which color he is. This is what I'm doing. Support Israel in their time of need. Get to life. Now available on DVD. Call 1-800-700-7000 or log on to CBN.com. And I wish that other people throughout the world could see this side of Israel. 
Heaven's Promise is committed to loving and serving at-risk children, to helping keep families together, and to creating opportunities for strong and sustainable communities around the world. We are working in over 60 countries around the world, and with your help, we can do even more. There's an old African proverb I love that says, if you want to run fast, run alone. But if you want to run far, run together. At Orphan's Promise, we want to run far so we can touch the lives of as many orphaned and vulnerable children as possible. But we don't want to go alone. We're out to change the world, one child, one family, one community at a time. Will you join us? Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl went to Jerusalem's open-air Mahane Yehuda Market to hear from Israelis what they're thinking about the upcoming elections. Take a look. Who would you like to see then form the government? I, I want to see the religion, Shas and Aguda, Yamina, and Netanyahu. Maybe Netanyahu, of course. Yeah. Maybe Netanyahu. Yeah, why? Because I think that he's working good, and I don't want the, the left side of the maps. Probably not going to be um, Likud, unfortunately, under its current leadership. The best option is Bibi Netanyahu. I'm not one of his fans. I don't agree with him, but I don't think someone can replace him right now. I think Bibi have really good reputation with other countries around us. I'm scared that if he won't be elected, like other country will start to like, oh, we don't know the new president and the state of Israel will start to get out of balance a little bit. I yell at Shaked, although I do not think that is very likely. It's possible, but not very likely. It's probably going to be Benjamin Netanyahu. For me, it's Benjamin Netanyahu. Lama. Why? Because he's a good man and he has a lot of brains, and there's no one like him. He cares about Israel, he cares about the Jews, he's a wise man. What's the most important issue for you in this election? I just want what's best for Israel. First, the security of Israel, and the education of the children, the social security for old people. It's sovereignty based on Judaism. The idea that Israel is given to us by God, and it belongs to us because of God. Good governance. Not making decisions on the basis of fear, but making decisions on the basis of what's actually good for the citizenry. Mainly housing, the needy, the elderly in the land, Holocaust survivors. Security, then the kalkalak. Economy. Economy, and then to, that will be a government uh, the right, not uh, from the left. Well, that's a taste of how Israelis are feeling about their upcoming elections. Their decision will affect the future of the Jewish state. So please pray for wisdom as they make this important decision. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us as we begin our ninth season with this program. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline. Mm -hmm.